Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today as we continue looking at the significance of intentionally circling up in relationship together. Now today we're going to look at, at three passages of scripture that tell the story of Jesus circling up with his disciples. And as we do, we'll notice that the circle actually has a center and that the center is Jesus. But before we look at those passages, let's, let's remind ourselves of what we mean when we say circles. We're differentiating between sitting in a service on a Sunday or even watching a sermon online and sitting in a room with a small group of people who are committed to Jesus and to each other. We're being challenged to move from rows on Sundays into circles on Mondays or really any other day of the week. Now, now rows are a great place to start our journey with Jesus. They're they're a great catalyst to building relationships in, in a church community. Rows are great for for receiving content. Sitting in rows feeds our brains and it can increase our knowledge. Rows can also be a very comfortable place to begin engaging with new people. It can be a great way to dip our toes in when we move into a new neighborhood or, or it's a great place to be curious about what it might look like to choose to follow Jesus. So we start in rows, but we don't stay there. We move from rows to circles because growth happens best in the context of community. But let's be real, circles can be incredibly intimidating and for so many different reasons, right? Sitting in a circle with a smaller group of people means having conversation, not simply listening to somebody else talk. In a row, we can disagree and we don't have to tell anyone about it. But in a circle, disagreement becomes a little more uncomfortable because we enter into a relationship and into a discussion. So we're invited to voice our disagreements. Not only that, but but in a circle, we're invited to be vulnerable and to share our lives with people in real ways. The question, how are you, isn't a pleasantry. It's actually an invitation to answer honestly and to share about our life. Sitting in a row doesn't require anything from us. We can simply consume. But sitting in a circle moves us from consuming to participating. While that might be intimidating, it's incredibly powerful. So as I said, we are, we're going to be looking at the life of Jesus as an example of this. And we see Jesus sitting in rows as a child, learning and growing. And we see him as an adult teaching groups of people who are in rows. But Jesus, who's God in the flesh, doesn't stay in rows. He moves from rows to circles. Let's look at a moment in the book of Mark where Jesus does exactly this. Mark chapter seven, verse 14 says, then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. He says, all of you listen, he said, and try to understand. He says, it's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes out from your heart. Then Jesus went, look at this, into a house to get away from the crowd. And his disciples asked him what he meant by the parable he had just used. So we see Jesus teaching in front of a crowd so that all of the people could hear, so that all of them could try to understand. But after he's done, he moves to a home with just a few people. And what do they do there? They discuss what Jesus just taught. The disciples gather around Jesus and explore more deeply what the words of Jesus meant for their lives. And this isn't the first time, and it's not the last time that Jesus and the disciples do this. The disciples are pretty thick-headed, and they often have a hard time understanding what Jesus is saying. So they consistently gather with Jesus after a teaching to further understand. They ask questions. They discuss among themselves, and they look to Jesus for more understanding. And what's so beautiful is Jesus takes the time that's necessary to come alongside them for their growth and for their maturity. This actually reminds me of when I was a kid. My dad and I would be working on my car or his motorcycle together, or he'd be teaching me to work our riding lawnmower or how to shoot a bow. And I had some of the dumbest questions in these moments for my dad, not only when I was eight, but also when I was 20. My dad though, when I would ask a question about how something worked. He would put down his tools. He would pick up a pen and a piece of paper and he'd start to draw out all the components of a combustion engine so I could understand the difference between a two-stroke and a four-stroke. He was patient. 
he was kind and, and he was transferring his knowledge and his experience to a younger, less knowledgeable, less experienced person. And not only did I grow in knowledge in that moment, I grew in relationship with my dad. We learned together, we grew together and we both matured together. Now I could have, I could have gotten the, the same information from YouTube or from a podcast or even a seminar with a, a hundred other people in the room, but I would have forsook the building of a meaningful relationship. Now, every time I, I'm, I'm working on a car or I'm working on a project at home, I know that because of the relationship I built, if I have a question, I can trust that my dad will walk alongside me with whatever knowledge he has. The relationship is what brought the information to life. And this is really how doing life in a circle works. And Jesus created this kind of connection with his disciples, not on the topic of a combustion engine, but on the topic of eternal life and the building of God's kingdom. It was in this circle of committed relationships that their curiosity grew and their understanding of Jesus increased. This circle became a safe place for the, for the disciples to, to ask questions like they did in this instance. And when they asked, Jesus brought them clarity. Look, he says, don't you understand either? Can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. Mark says, by saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. See, when we circle up with others and when Jesus is the center of that circle, we not only gain clarity on what Jesus has already instructed us to do, we gain new insight on it as well. Instead of the disciples now being concerned about the food they eat, this was the custom of their day, Jesus reorients their attention to what actually defiles a person. He continues and, and he adds, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things come from within. They are what defile you. See, in this circle, Jesus brings clarity. And in that clarity, his disciples, which include you and me, are called to change the way that we think and act. This happens in a circle like this, not in a row. Again, circles aren't comfortable but growth never is. Clarity drives us to commit to a, a new or different action in our lives. It's in community that we find accountability to actually change. Staying in rows means we will never really be known. And if we're never known, we'll never be held accountable to act on the understanding that we've gained through the word of God and through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And what we understand should translate into who we are and to how we live. See, understanding becomes undertaking when we're relationally responsible to each other. This only happens when we're connected to other people intentionally. And Jesus calls his disciples not only into homes to circle up, but he also sends them out to develop relationships in other towns and in other neighborhoods. Let's take a look in Luke chapter nine, when Jesus does this. He says, one day Jesus called together the 12, the disciples, and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out. He sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He sent them to build the kingdom of God. It was a shift in their focus once again. It wasn't about building the kingdom of Israel anymore. It was about something bigger. Then he said this, he said, take nothing for your journey. He instructed them, don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, don't take food or money or even a change of clothes. Wherever you go, though, stay in the same house until you leave town. He says, don't take anything that will, that will provide for you. Don't take anything that might make you feel comfortable. Instead, Jesus challenges his disciples to sacrifice their comforts and to depend on others for what they needed. In other words, God will supply you with your needs through the people you encounter 
in the towns that you visit. And he also instructed them, stay. Stay in the same house. Don't bounce around in different places with different people. Instead, develop a deep relationship with just a few. Now, I don't know about you, but, but when I go on vacation, I have a hard time not being busy. I wanna meet all the people. I wanna see all the things. But Jesus is instructing them and he's inviting us to build deep connections with other people for their benefit and for the purpose of God's kingdom. Remember what he sent them out to do, right? He, he sent them out to tell people about the kingdom and to bring healing. In other words, this journey isn't about you. It's about other people's place in the kingdom of God. Which brings us to this next question. Like, what if, what if people don't accept us? What if people are unwilling to let us stay? What if people don't want to connect? What if people aren't interested in knowing us or being known by us? What if people aren't interested in growing? Well, Jesus responds. He says, and if a town refuses these things, if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the good news and healing the sick. He says, if no one welcomes you, don't take anything with you from that town, not even the dust that's on your sandals. Let them be to their own fate. In other words, allow them to experience the results of their rejection. Allow them to reject the kingdom of God and the healing that comes with it. This is really an, an invitation to let go, not just of dust, but of the hurt and rejection that may have been demonstrated in that in that, to let it go and to, to keep moving the good news of the kingdom of heaven across the world. No encouragement for angry protests or boycotts or the writing of position papers. Jesus says, stay on mission. They made their choice. So move along and offer the opportunity to others because the mission Jesus sent them on was never about them. It was about the kingdom. And our mission it's not about us. It's about the kingdom of God and doing life together with other believers who are on mission also keeps us on mission because cir circling up moves us from self-serving action in a, in a self-serving life to kingdom serving action and a kingdom serving life. The center of our circles ought to be Jesus, the King of Kings, who's building a new kingdom marked by peace and marked by justice. Now, one last example of, of Jesus inviting people to be in circles of relationship comes in Luke 24. After Jesus has died and resurrected, the disciples are circled up already. They're in a home. This has been demonstrated for them already, but the door's locked because they're scared. See, they aren't circled up around Jesus because they think he's dead and that someone may have stolen his body from the tomb. And that's when Jesus shows up. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. <laughs> they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. But he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? He says, look at my hands and my feet. It is, it is I myself, it's me. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his feet. See, this is so cool in so many ways. But perhaps the most incredible part is how caring Jesus is in this moment. Jesus demonstrates that, that he knew them and, and he knew their anxious thoughts, that he knew what they needed. He knew they were scared and, and unsure and, and doubting the last three years of their lives that they spent with him. And he met them there. He showed up to be present with them, not to condemn them. While they were circling up together in a house, trying to comfort one another, it wasn't until Jesus showed up at the center that they experienced peace, reassurance, and encouragement. And when we gather around Jesus, that same peace and encouragement gets applied to our startled, frightened, and troubled minds. And he invites us to look to him together when doubts arise. And he does that for the disciples right here. He says, and while they still 
did not believe. While they're still struggling because of joy and amazement, he asked them, hey, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Take a look at what Jesus did. Don't miss this. He ate with them. Eating takes time. He gave them what they needed, not what he needed. Jesus didn't need food, but his disciples needed to know that he was present, that he was there, that he was with them. Food isn't necessary in our fellowship together. Jesus is necessary. But eating together does force us to slow down, to look at each other in the eyes, to talk and to share. And Jesus sat down to do just that. But he didn't just reassure them with his presence. He reassures them with scripture. It says, then he opened their eyes, their minds, sorry, so, so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these, th- of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. See, Jesus gave them confidence from scripture. Jesus gave gave them confidence in what would flow from their obedience. He gave them confidence that the, the spirit would fill them with power. And he reset confidence in their original mission to tell people about the kingdom of God and to bring healing. And when we gather together around Jesus, we find a confidence and a connection we can't find in other contexts because circling up grows us in confidence and relationship, both in knowing God more deeply and being known by God and by others more deeply. So as we move into the fall, I wanna invite you to circle up with other followers of Jesus young and old, men and women, so that we can all grow together. So we can learn together, be inspired together and find a deeper confidence in Jesus and live obedient to his calling for each of our lives. Now there's, there's so many ways for us to circle up at each of our campuses. There's Rooted, which is an opportunity for you to join in conversations about faith, the Bible and your purpose. We have home communities at each of our campuses, which are small groups of people who are gathering regularly to connect with each other and and to pursue Jesus together. We have women's community and men's community at our campuses with the same purpose of, of building connections with Jesus and building relationship with each other. And there's opportunities to join a team to, to serve in the context of community with each other, to build the kingdom of God together. And all of these opportunities we've put together for the people of God to move from rows into circles in order to grow in relationship. And to learn more about any of these opportunities, you can visit our website uh, to to check out uh, those opportunities. You can visit one of the next steps tables at any one of our campuses on a Sunday morning to learn more. But here's here's what I want to leave us with today. This isn't about promoting one of the ministries we have at any one of our campuses. These ministries I've I've mentioned aren't an end in and of themselves. Each of these serves a purpose, the purpose of building community and connection that leads to spiritual growth and maturity. The purpose to provide ways for us to gather together, to look to Jesus, to learn from and to teach each other. The purpose is to inspire one another to know, love, and follow Jesus and to go out into our community and serve others by telling them about the kingdom of God and bringing the healing that comes only from the power of the presence of Jesus. We're not trying to push people into a program. We are trying to create spaces that cause each of us to grow. So I just wanna ask you today, what does growth in this next season look like for you? Where is your circle of people focused and centered on Jesus and focused and centered on his mission? And if you don't have one, what would it look like for you to take a risk, 
to be known, to, to pursue Jesus alongside others who are pursuing him and to participate in meaningful ways in the building of God's kingdom. I'm gonna challenge you today. Will you take that next step, moving from a row into a circle? Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you for relationship. Thank you for connection. And God, thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to, to come and be among your people. God, thank you for the example that Jesus is, not only in him coming from heaven to earth to be known and to know us, but God, for the example of him circling up in relationship with others. God, I pray for the, 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 the timidity that revolves around this idea of sharing life with someone else. God, would you give us courage to step into a circle from a row? God, would you give us wisdom in what's best for us next? And God, may we, as we choose to circle up together, may we commit to being a safe place for people to, to be who they are. May we love each other well, and may we share the good news of the gospel with our communities. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We love you guys, and we hope you have an excellent week.